Hi, everyone, and welcome to this month's Simon Says Expert Series. I'm Dr. Kathy Miller. I'm a medical oncologist who specializes in breast cancer. And like my colleagues who will join us today, I'm also a researcher. I spend my time designing and leading breast cancer clinical trials with the goal of improving the lives of, of our patients. And I also serve as our Cancer Center's Associate Director for Clinical Research. Today's presenters are going to talk with us about the world's only healthy breast tissue bank, the Susan G. Komen Tissue Bank that's housed at the IU Simon Comprehensive Cancer Center. That bank has been advancing breast cancer research for the past 15 years. It was my colleague, Dr. Anna Maria Storniolo, who co-founded the bank all those years ago. This groundbreaking effort sought to do something unheard of, collect healthy breast tissue to help researchers understand normal. The idea was very simple, that by determining the differences between healthy and cancerous breast tissues, researchers could better understand the underpinnings of breast cancer. Dr. Storniolo's impactful work will be a legacy for breast cancer researchers everywhere. And with ongoing support from the Susan G. Komen Foundation and the Vera Bradley Foundation, this trailblazing work will continue. Dr. Michelle Cote is the incoming director of the Komen Tissue Bank. She's an internationally recognized molecular cancer epidemiologist and health disparities researcher. Dr. Cote plans to expand the bank's research with an epidemiologic focus, studying the impact of long-term lifestyle and environmental influences on breast biology. It is a true pleasure to have my colleagues from the Cancer Center and the Vera Bradley Foundation for Breast Cancer Research join us here today for this Simon Says session. Dr. Storniolo? Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this Simon Says. I'm really delighted to be able to present this work to you all today. So I'm just going to start by, uh, by telling you what, what is the Komen Tissue Bank. It is the only biorepository in the world, actually, of annotated breast specimens which have been donated by healthy volunteers that do not have any evidence of breast cancer. It is also a breast cancer research resource, which is both founded and funded by breast cancer advocates. Next slide. This is a timeline of where we've been and where we hope to go. This starts in 1998, where the picture that you see there is of Connie Rufenbarger. She participated in a progress review group that was um, put together by the National Cancer Institute. And they looked back at the prior 10 years and thought about what, what, what had, what progress had been made in the in the research of breast cancer and what needed to be done. And actually at the top of their list of what needed to be done was research in progress in the development and understanding of the normal breast. She thought that that was going to happen right away. And actually like uh, as happens in many things, uh, the report got shelved and not a whole lot happened to it. Fast forward to 2003, sorry, where at IU, at a conference, it was mentioned that in fact, there was no known source of normal breast tissue. This started a long journey and a process where Connie approached me and would not let this process die. Um, and we together, um, began to look at what would it take to actually start a, a repository of normal specimens. We started looking just at blood and blood to be to be stored for future research. At the time, this was not easy to do, and we managed that in 2005. We then had some small pilot tissue collections, which were funded by generous local philanthropy. And finally, in 2007, we approached Susan G. Komen with this idea, which at the time was still considered a bit crazy. And they showed immense faith and, um, and have been our primary funder ever since. You can see that in, um, 
that we have grown since that point in 2012. You'll see shortly that we were one of the projects um, that were sponsored by the Super Bowl. In 2014, we formalized our collection of longitudinal data. And by 2022, we have now have specimens from over 6,400 women. And actually in November, just a few weeks ago, we collected our first specimens from men. Next slide. The goals of the tissue bank are to acquire tissue specimens and biomolecules from the entire continuum of breast development, all the way from puberty to menopause and now from men. Our, it's important for us to recruit donors who, who truly represent the diversity of women in America and to make the bank's specimens available and accessible to researchers everywhere across the globe. Finally, our intent always has been to accelerate the path to a cure and therefore all of the data that results from use of our specimens comes back to the bank and is posted um, and is, is shareable to researchers across the, um, across the globe. Next slide. This tells us how many samples um, as of April of this year were in the bank. Um, it says 5723 in terms of tissue specimens. That's because some of our um, donors have donated more than more than once. So actually, though, we have uh, a total of approximately 6,400 specimens. Some women have donated more than once. Um, you can see that uh, we have DNA from almost 12,000 women. That is because we've donated, uh, we started uh, with blood donations only. Next slide. You can see by this slide that one person's donation goes a very long way. Um, we have whole blood DNA, um, fresh frozen breast tissue, which also then gets pro processed as cryopreserved breast tissue and is used then to set up um, uh, tissue cultures. We have blocks, which are then made into slides. In the blood, it's processed into serum and plasma. We also, for women that have um, that are old enough to have had mammograms, we request their mammograms and also post the, those. Next slide. We are very proud of the fact that a quarter of our, our specimens are from women of color. 17% of those are, are women of African descent. This actually exceeds the percentage of African-American women in the Indianapolis area. This far exceeds the percentage of um, women of color in any um, clinical trial in breast in, in, in cancer actually that we know of. So this is, we have done quite well in our goal of um, accruing women to our study that truly represent the diversity of, of, of women in, in, in this country. Um, we are working very hard at, at accepting Hispanic women 8% of our collection represents the Hispanic population. Next slide. As I told you earlier in 2012, as part of the Super Bowl um, program, we, we um, actually put on a huge tissue collection over two days, the weekend before the, the Super Bowl. Um, you can see there that we were part of the Today Show. More importantly, we we had 600 donors over two days, a thousand volunteers, um, many many church groups, uh, many many groups of um, uh, work groups. You can see there a professional African American um, women's group. It was uh, quite the event. Next slide. Sorry. And next slide. Nope. 
back up one. And finally, as I told you, all of the the um, all of the data that um, is derived from our specimens comes back and is posted on what we call our virtual tissue bank. Uh, you can see the um, the web address there. This this website includes not only information for our donors and volunteers, but also, as I said, the um, the data itself, proposal instructions for our scientists. It includes the manuscripts that have resulted from our data, including um, over 80 papers now that have published using our data. Um, the specimens have been used in over 198 projects to date. And Dr. Cote will um, take it from here. Thank you so much. Um, so I think you all have some idea of what an enormous resource this is, not just for Indiana University or the Simon Comprehensive Cancer Center, but also for investigators from around the world. And the infrastructure here really allows us to ask questions that prior to this time, we just didn't have the resources or the ability to answer. And so the very first question was, is whether or not the tissue that we were collecting was truly normal. You know, prior to this time, most researchers used tissue that was adjacent to the tumor. And I think a lot of scientists understood that this wasn't ideal, that there's something known as a field effect, that you know, the tumor is sending out different signals to the surrounding cells. I mean, that's how the tumors grow oftentimes. And so that this isn't necessarily the best type of normal tissue, but it was the best that was available at the time. And so this was early work done. This was published in you know, January of 2014, so not quite 10 years ago, where um, an investigator, Dr. Radovich, sequenced cells that were collected from the normal from normal tissue collected by the by the uh, Coleman Tissue Bank, as well as um, tissue that was adjacent to triple negative breast cancers. Um, and then finally, the tumors themselves. And so what you can see here is an analysis, they call it principal components analysis, and the details aren't important. But what's nice is that you can see from these different clusters here that you know they're quite different and that the common normal tissue is um, on the blue that is to the left of the screen, uh, the adjacent tissue that was collected from the cancer um, adjacent to the cancers are those green dots in the middle. And then the triple negative breast cancers um, that were both um, available here, as well as from um, a national resource called the TCGA or the Cancer Genome Atlas are clustered there in the red. So those green cells or the green dots uh, that is what had been being used as normal. And you can really see here very simply that it isn't as normal as, as we would have hoped it would be. Um, so then the next question was, well, in what ways does healthy breast tissue differ? And so we had colleagues at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, who did, um, I think, a, a simple but very elegant analysis. And so the pink lines here indicate whether these are um, from the Komen tissue bank specimens. Another resource potentially for normal breast tissue is from um, reduction surgeries. And those are shown here in the lighter blue. And then in the medium blue or the darker blue, these are benign breast disease tissues. So the vast majority of biopsies, if you go in for a clinical biopsy, come back and, and are benign, which is good news. You know, you don't want them to be malignant. Um, but what they did is they classified these three different types of tissue using parameters that were established in the mid-1980s um, by two investigators, um, Drs. DuPont and Page, um, out of Nashville. And this is just a simple look at the tissues underneath the microscope. And the pathologist can look and they can say, all right, 
everything looks looks normal here. Um, and that's the first kind of three columns that you see, the NHA, no histologic abnormality. The cells are all uniform. There's the number expected. Um, they, they all look pretty similar. And so that's you know, kind of true normal tissue. And you can see there in the, the pink line, most of our specimens from this experiment in the Coleman tissue bank are kind of that, that true no histologic abnormality. The second group is when there's non-proliferative disease. So there's changes in the tissue. Again, these are not cancerous changes, but there's changes in the tissue um, that indicate that there's, there's something a little bit different. And you can see here that when you start looking at reduction um, mammoplasty and tissue from the benign breast disease, the majority of those two types of tissues fall into that non-proliferative disease. Um, the next category over indicated by the P, that's proliferative disease. It's where the cells still look pretty normal, but there's a lot more of them than one would expect. And again, you can see the dominance of the reduction mammoplasties and the BBD, benign breast disease tissues in there. And then the final category, and this is a benign condition, um, but it, it is clinically actionable. There's, there's concern that if you have um, a typical hyperplasia, and so that's where there's kind of an overgrowth of cells, and they're starting to look a little bit different. Um, you want your tissue to be as uniform as possible, and in, in this case, um, there's some differences that the pathologist can see, and those are cases of a typical hyperplasia. And you can see here that the Coleman tissue bank and the reduction mammoplasty are really, really low, but the benign breast disease samples are, are somewhat higher. So we know from this experiment that absolutely healthy breast tissue does look really different than other things that had been used in the past as normal controls. So what sorts of research can be done? And I'm gonna go through just one or two examples with each of these. Um, so we talked about earlier that the mammograms are collected for women who are of age to have had a screening mammogram. And you, know, you can see here in this picture, this is an example of breast density. And so radiologists can look at these images and they can say, oh boy, you know, the, the breast on the left is a little bit less dense than the breast on the right, which you can see the white there, um, a little more dense. So we can look at the mammograms of these women that we're collecting tissue on and, and kind of more in a moment on that. The next is blood. So we collect blood um, from the vast majority of the women, donate both um, a tissue sample as well as a blood specimen. And it's the kind of the sky's the limit on what we can do with blood. There's all sorts of um, genetic markers. So you can look at your germline, what you inherited from your parents. You can look at things like um, markers of inflammation. You know, if we wanted to, we could measure blood sugar in these women and then all sorts of other omic technologies. And so it's things like proteomics, where you look at the proteins that are being expressed or just the regular genomics, where you can, can look at, um, like I said, germline variation in, between people. So that's, that's with blood. Um, we do questionnaire data. And so the questionnaire, you know, maybe takes around 15 or 20 minutes. Um, and if you've participated as a, as a donor, um, you're, you're familiar with the questions, but really what we're asking about is we're trying to calculate established um, scores for risk of breast cancer. So we ask about known risk factors, things like if you have a family history of disease, if you've ever had a prior benign breast biopsy. We ask a lot of different questions about um, your reproductive history, how many children you've had, um, those sorts of things. Uh, have been used across the country um, in some risk models that give you an idea as to um, how high or low your potential risk of breast cancer is. This also allows us uh, the ability to identify special groups. So if we have a researcher who comes to us and says, you know, I'm really interested in women um, who've had a recent pregnancy. Can you identify samples from women who've had a pregnancy within the last five years? The answer is yes, we can. 
And so that's the questionnaire data can be used in a, in a number of different ways, kind of on its own or to identify groups of special interest. And then lastly, um, we do an annual follow up. So um, on the month of your birthday, you will get an email from us. And it's a very short survey, not like the original questionnaire. It can take you know just a couple of minutes to answer. And this gives you an opportunity to update your family history, your own personal health information. And so we can identify, in particular, if a person has developed breast cancer um, since the time of their annual follow-up. And so those kind of four pieces of data here is really, I think, what the strength and the value of the Coleman Tissue Bank is. It's the fact that we have all of this. So we've got the mammograms, we've got the blood, we've got detailed, detailed questionnaire data, and we call that well annotated data. And then we've got the follow up um, every year, um, you know, after the donation. And then that in the middle is is kind of what the specimens look like. And I'm always sad when I look at it that our tissue isn't isn't pretty. But um, this is a petri dish, and this is you know an example of of what breast tissue and other tissue looks like. And so it's really the combination of all of those um, different things that's really powerful. You know, there's studies that have been done, you know, since the 1980s or even earlier, but, you know, one big study is, is called the Women's Health Initiative, and this was a study of 90,000 women um, throughout the United States, and they've, they've got blood on some of these women. They certainly have, you know, very um, detailed questionnaire data. They've got good follow-up on them, but for the most part, what they're lacking are the mammograms and then certainly the normal tissue. So before women developed a, a cancer, they don't have those tissue tissues. And so that to me is really the value of this moving forward is having access to all of these. And so we can correlate um, you know, findings in the tissue with findings in the blood, which is important for when you think about you know, some sort of developing some sort of medical test. Um, it's much easier to get blood than it is to get, um, you know, tissue from a person. And so having both right there from the same person collected at the same time under, you know, really specific protocols is, is really, really powerful. So what else are we planning on doing? Um, we hope to hit the road again. So while about 85% of the people in our registry come from the state of Indiana. We have done um, tissue collection events outside of Indiana too. And you can see a few here, you know, California, Arizona, down in Texas, um, other places in the Midwest, Louisville, Chicago, Detroit. Um, the, the purple there indicates bus trips where um, we were able to um, have buses come with interested people and bring them here to IU to donate. And so, you know, you can see the red, the upcoming tissue bank, uh, tissue collection events. Um, we don't have any red on the map yet, and we're really looking forward to being able to hit the road probably sometime in 2024, because this takes quite a bit of advanced planning. Um, but, you know, we want to be sure, as Dr. Sterniolo said, we have as um, diverse of samples as we possibly can, we really want to represent all of the people in the United States, not just those of us in the Midwest. So what else are we going to do? I, I've labeled this KTB the next 15 years. Um, you know, our number one goal, of course, is to maintain what is already in place. And that is the high quality data collection and protocols, the management of all of these data, and then scientific collaborations and to making sure that we still provide access to all of these data to anybody who's interested, who's, who has a solid scientific question. We're going to continue to build out the longitudinal cohort. And so what I mean is the, the following people up, following people over time. Like I said, that um, data is, is super important to understand what's going on. Um, we want to validate the information that's given to us. We want a little more detail, perhaps, about um, the types of cancers that are developing and how those cancers are being treated, um, and possibly to collect other available tissue um, from, from people over time. 
Uh, we can utilize this cohort because it's such an amazing collection of people. You know, I'm talking a lot about tissue, but I, I never want to forget that, that the tissue comes from incredibly generous donors who really get nothing except for hopefully the satisfaction of knowing they're playing a really large role in trying to prevent breast cancer in future generations. And so this cohort of people is incredibly committed to scientific research. And so this is a great place where we can start testing different tools that are kind of coming down the scientific pipeline to see you know, how uh, good they are in terms of in the general population, you know, measuring things like environmental exposures, um, different ways of uh, collecting data or even things like blood from people that can be done remotely. All of this can be tested in the Coleman Tissue Bank. And then lastly, really trying to leverage this combination, um, the, the imaging studies, um, along with all of the data that are collected um, that can be used for epidemiologic studies. Um, the pathology is, is you know, definitely a growing area, especially with digital pathology or things like artificial intelligence, where you can use computers to help us look at the tissue in an unbiased way to see what's going on. Of course, molecular biology, I mean, everything has grown. You know, we know a lot of the direct to consumer testing like 23andMe, you know, that wasn't available 15 years ago is, is very common now and much less expensive. And then lastly, the, the clinical piece of this as well, for the women who have gone on and developed a subsequent cancer, you know, that's, Unfortunately, it's a larger cohort every year, and so we can use this to work with our clinical colleagues to help them answer questions that are interesting to them. And then the final piece is actually men. We've got a, a whole new world to look at here, so to speak. So none of this happens, of course, without um, a lot of support from a number of different foundations, um, as well as Indiana University. You can see our partners here. Um, and I think with that, we can start taking some questions. So I'm gonna stop sharing and bring it back. Thank you both. I, I know I'm feeling inspired and I'm sure our audience is as well. Um, while people are thinking of their questions, we have some questions that uh, people who registered for Simon Says have already sent in. Um, it, it, Michelle, one uh, questioner is asking about the sister study um, it, and how what we're learning from the tissue bank might complement what we're learning from the sister study. Yeah, so the sister study is a little bit different in how they collected um, their from what I know of it, from how they collected their cohort. So they have women who've already developed breast cancer, and then they recruit a, a sister, a sibling. And a lot of their focus is in environmental health, which is great. Uh, what we can do is we can provide the normal tissue um, for those, those sibling pairs. So that's sib pairs is what I would call them in epi speak. Um, you know, we can match, you know, women in their study um, by, by age, we can match them by race and ethnicity, we could even match them by exposures, you know, women who've never had children, and we can look at some of the differences in terms of um, environmental exposures between the women in the sister study and women who donated to our, our normal cohort. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So there's another question that, that really highlights the generosity of the donors to this bank. Um, someone said, I donated my breast tissue during the first collection. I'm interested to know if the tissue still remains from that first collection or if more is needed. Um, I, how do these generous donors find out if more tissue is needed? Are you looking for people to, to donate a second time? So I can answer that and A, that yes, some of the tissue still is is um, still exists from the first donation. The we use the tissue according to the questions that are asked. So all kinds of questions have been asked. So somebody might say, "I need tissue from someone who was hypertensive during their pregnancies." Believe it or not, that was one of the questions. So depending on the questions that are asked, that tissue gets pulled out. 
um, we we are finally at a point where tissue needs to be replenished. And so we have asked people to donate every five years or so if they wish. And so to that generous person, uh, yes, please come back. Thank you. There uh, is also a question about um, how artificial intelligence could help make more of the tissue bank specifically and, and research in general. I'm going to toss that to you, Dr. Cote, because artificial intelligence is, is beyond my knowledge base. Yeah, and I don't pretend to be, you know, an AI person either, but what it does, so what I know mostly about it is with using the tissue. So as we mentioned, you know, we've got um, from every sample, there's fresh frozen tissue as well as paraffin embedded. And so paraffin is wax. So it's like a wax embedded um, tissue block. And you can take and you can slice the tissue very, very thin and you can put it on a slide. And then you can stain that tissue with different chemicals. And those chemicals we know have, have different um, attractions to different um, things in the cell let's say, what or how artificial intelligence has been used for some of that is to just standardize um, how things are being examined and counted. So one example of that would be if you wanted to know, if you wanted to standardize how quickly cells were dividing, you know, we talked about hyperplasia, um, which is, you know, the cells look normal, but there's more of them than you would expect instead of having usually some poor medical student have to sit there and count the cells on a certain you know size of the slide but by eye by hand which of course introduces all sorts of error instead of doing that in theory you could scan those slides and you could train the computer to identify okay this is a cell and it could go through that and it could count in you know what would take a human minutes, it could do it in seconds. And it's it's same with different structures in the breast. You could um, you could train the computer to look for certain similar characteristics um, for different types of benign breast disease or breast cancer and so on. So that's just kind of the very tip of the iceberg of, of what can be done. And again, the other beautiful thing about it is it's it's on slides it costs almost nothing for us to um, make those slides available to researchers all around the world. Um, you know, it's, you don't even send them through the mail. You can do this, this all electronically through, um, you know, protected file sharing. So another question that was sent ahead gets to um, the question of diversity in the bank. I know you've had a, a big focus in trying to get the diversity of the population in the United States, um, but what about the diversity globally? And are there populations uh, in Africa or in Asia that, that we might not be capturing? Do we have a way to do that? I can start and then Michelle can look to the future. Um, we have been asked that, um, can we go globally? Um, I would I would have loved to. We, we have made a little bit of an effort. What you run into is, um, and, and going to Europe would not really fix that because it, it basically reproduces our own population. So going to areas of the world um, where we would find populations that are underrepresented here are generally parts of the world where we start ha having issues with exporting tissue, basically. It is very, very difficult to move tissue out of a country. And so um, we have tried once um, and failed. Um, but but that was a while ago, and I think it's worth a try um, again. Michelle, anything to add to that? Yeah, no, I would agree with that. You know, in particular, you know, talking about um, the types of breast cancers that develop, you know, in our African American here in the US, you know, being able to go back. Um, 
you know, two different countries in Africa and look to see if there are, you know, what are the similarities and differences in that tissue would be fascinating. But we do, you know, want to make sure that we can really build something with, um, you know, whatever organization we partner with over there, that it isn't just, you know, coming, taking the tissue and, and running sort of thing. We want to make sure that, you know, we can form good, long-lasting partnerships where the people who are donating the tissue can benefit, um, you know, maybe not directly, but in future generations. Thank you. So one other question that was sent ahead of time uh, is asking about new genetic research. Are we learning about more genes that increase risk? Um, and how might the tissue bank help move that genetic research forward? Well, this started before I got here a couple of months ago, but we have partnered with the National Cancer Institute has an enormous study that's ongoing um, that we have uh, that you know, they have selected us to participate in. It's called Confluence, and it is looking at the genetics of 300,000 women with and 300,000 women without breast cancer. And that is going to give um, us the power to look at um, disease associations for really rare genotypes. So, you know, we are 99.99 something percent similar but the differences are enough to increase or decrease our risk in different ways. And so I, I would guess, and I haven't pulled the numbers recently, but you know, we have at least 200 um, genetic changes that we know are associated with some level of increased risk, but most of them are associated with such a minimal increase in risk. There's nothing really actionable you can you can do about it. And the fact is you you also can't change, you know, your your genetics. Um, but yeah, so we are participating in those sorts of projects as well. The other thing is uh, Dr. Hari Nakshatri on our faculty has been working um, very uh, intensely with our with our specimens and has um, really uncovered some very interesting differences between um, racial, um, some racial differences between uh, specimens, um, specifically um, uh, tissue from um, women of African descent versus vis-a-vis -vis women of Cauca uh, Caucasian women, and um, that, that will likely point to differences in risk and risk profiles. Um, so that's also really interesting. Thank you. So we have one question submitted during our conference that, that is perhaps maybe not directly related to the tissue bank, uh, but Dr. Storniolo, they're wondering, are there any tests in the pipeline to detect breast cancer that's metastasized um, before it might cause symptoms, before it might show up on a scan? Um, this is someone uh, who is about to mark nine years after diagnosis and treatment, um, but still worries about recurrence. This is a common problem, I know. Well, you can answer this question as well, but um, I'll put in my two cents worth. The um, it's This is the million dollar question, and um, a lot of work is being done with this. Um, the the um, it's interesting that the tissue bank at this point is not looking at this. We're really working on the, the front end of what are the differences between women who develop breast cancer and those who do not. But for this um, woman, there are many people in this, um, in this situation. There are circulating tumor cells that are um, really being looked at very, very carefully, um, uh, circulating tumor DNA, um, which is being looked at very, very carefully. Um, one of the theories of metastatic disease is that um, uh, cells go very early in the in the in the process to our bone marrow and then just sit there and become dormant and um and then for reasons that no one really understands right now get woken up 
and and at that point go through the bloodstream and metastasize. And so the question is, what wakes them up or do they ever have to be woken up? And so that question of dormancy and circulating tumor DNA and circulating tumor cells is very, very, very hot right now, but, but certainly not ready for prime time at all. What would you add, Kathy? Uh, I, absolutely. It's a huge area of research. Nothing right now that should be moved into clinical practice, but we, we know the fear of recurrence is quite real. Um, so we need to both look at how might we identify disease earlier. We also need to help patients deal with the fear of recurrence because those are not always so, so closely correlated, but they're both real problems. I think we have time for uh, maybe one more question, um, which is also from our breast cancer survivors. Um, the goal of the tissue bank was to, uh, to get healthy tissue to learn about the early steps in the process. Um, but there's a question about our breast cancer survivors and whether donations from their remaining breast might also be useful. Might it tell us how tissue changes after hormone therapy or after chemotherapy? Might that help us identify women at greater risk of developing a second breast cancer in their other breast? That's an excellent question. I'll start and then Michelle can add. Um, we do, early on, we did not um, accept tissue from the from the other breast. And we learned um, very quickly that um, women re women who already had had one breast cancer very much wanted to help. And so now um, we do, if you have had a breast cancer in one breast and the other breast has not been radiated, you may donate from the unradiated um, breast. Um, as long as it doesn't have an implant in it, because we're worried that with a, a needle, we might um, burst the implant. But um, the, the reason you're at the questioner is, is asking is, is absolutely um, spot on for a variety of things. And we can, although we're interested in early risk, that question of risk of recurrence is, is truly fascinating and we can get at it possibly because we do ask the questions about in the questionnaire about what medicines are you on what medicines have you already been on if you've been on chemotherapy what drugs were you on um so all of that medicine all of that is available and what makes our our tissue bank unique besides the fact that it's there is that that tissue has a story um, and it's unusual for any tissue bank to have as detailed a story as our specimens have. Michelle? Yeah, no, I would say, you know, it's um, somewhere around 10% of the tissues um, in the bank are from women who've had a, a prior breast cancer. And for all of the reasons Anna Maria said, you know, it's really, really important to have that tissue. You know, we also have women um, in there who have BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations. So they have a known large um, potential risk of developing cancer. And, you know, we've got researchers who are very, very interested in looking at what are the tissue differences in women with these, you know, germline or inherited mutations um, compared to women who don't. So, you know, yes, it's going to be a resource, um, not just looking at ways to prevent, you know, primary prevention, prevent the cancer from occurring completely, but in epidemiology, we call it tertiary prevention, which is preventing recurrences. Thank you so much for, for joining us and, and sharing with us the history of the tissue bank and for looking forward uh, to the next 15 years right? and all of the great things that we will continue to learn from the tissue bank. Thank you for joining us. You can learn more about next month, Simon says, and find a recording of today's session at cancer.iu.edu slash Simon says. <laughs>